Well, happy Feast of Tabernacles, brethren. It is amazing that we are here again this year, enjoying the feast, something that God created for us to help paint a vision for us of our future and for the future of the world. It's amazing to think that our Father in Heaven and our elder brother Jesus Christ have issued to each of us an invitation, a personal invitation to be right here in the places where He has commanded and set aside the opportunity for us to be for eight days. Fellowshipping, learning, coming to understand more deeply the meaning of this incredible Feast of Tabernacles. Brethren, how desperately do the people of the world need God's kingdom? Think about that as we go through the sermon today. How badly do they need it? How badly does the world need God's righteous laws to follow? And how badly does it need God's righteous government? As we look around the world today, what do we see? We see dictators ruling over nations, taking for themselves and putting down people to do it. We see nations falling apart. We see chaos. We see anarchy. We see terrorism. We see all kinds of atrocities happening. We see the degradation of once moral societies falling into disarray and the peoples of these societies suffering because of it, even in the Western world. Brethren, how badly does the earth itself need God's kingdom and a population to respectfully dress and keep it as God intended? When we look around at the creation, we see, as Romans 8 talks about, a creation groaning in travail, don't we? We see pollution all over the place. We see species after species of animals being decimated. Brethren, how badly does this world need God's kingdom? What do you look forward to most about the coming kingdom of God on the earth? The thousand-year reign of Christ and us, the saints, what do you look forward to doing during this awesome time? And young people, what do you look forward to about God's kingdom, about being in God's kingdom? Young people, the reality is that you will probably be a spirit being in God's kingdom. Dr. Meredith reminds us from time to time that the tribulation could start eight to 18 years from now. We don't know exactly. But brethren, if the tribulation doesn't start until 18 years from now, and then you add three and a half years to that till the return of Christ, we're talking potentially 15, 20 years or more before the return of Christ. Young people, how old will you be in 15 or 20 years? The reality is you will have the opportunity to be converted probably before Christ returns if you choose that path. And you'll have the opportunity to, with your parents and your grandparents, to rule and reign on the earth with Christ. What will we be doing? What do you look forward to doing during this awesome time? Brethren, what underlying foundational approach to God's way of life will be the bedrock of the kingdom of God? What approach, as opposed to Satan's approach, will underlie God's kingdom? And one final question as we start, who is the millennium ultimately for? Who is the millennium ultimately for? Who will ultimately benefit from the millennium? Brethren, my purpose today is to clearly demonstrate to you how the true purpose of the first fruits of God during the millennium, those first fruits who will rule and reign with Christ for a thousand years and beyond, will assist Christ in giving God's kingdom to the world. If you're looking for a title for the sermon today, that's it. Giving God's kingdom to the world. Last year, after the Feast of Tabernacles, the feast ended on a Thursday. We had the Sabbath after the Feast of Tabernacles. My family and I had the privilege of remaining in Park City, Utah for a few days after the feast. We spent the Sabbath there in Park City with about 50 brethren who also stayed back. 
The next day, Sunday morning, I had a goal for myself. I wanted to go back over my sermon notes, my sermonette notes from the feast in detail. We had just finished the feast, and that Sabbath after the feast, I had actually gone over my notes daily during the feast, but I hadn't gone over them collectively from front to back. And so my goal on Sunday after the feast, Sunday morning, was to get up early and go through my notes. And I was excited. I got up early. It was still dark outside. I lit a fire in the fireplace of our condo. I made myself a nice hot cup of tea, turned on the lights, and I began reviewing my sermon notes. And I prayed before I did that, God, please help me take in from these messages something that maybe I've missed, a, a message, a bigger overall message that you really want me to take in from this and that you want all of us to take in from this. And I began reviewing my sermon notes, my sermonette notes, and I got more and more excited. I ended up pulling out my laptop computer and making sermon notes for a feast for this year. This is just a couple days after the feast last year. I was so excited about what I was, the connections I was making that I felt like I had to write it down and it's something I wanted to share with God's people. It's not a new truth. This is something that I think the church has known and understood for a long time. It's something I've never heard articulated quite this way before, but I think you'll be excited by what we're going to talk about today about giving God's kingdom to the world. For those of you spiritual old timers, how did Mr. Armstrong typically begin his sermons at the Feast of Tabernacles, especially in the last years of his life? Now I say spiritual old timers because that doesn't necessarily mean you're real old chronologically. This is my 45th Feast of Tabernacles. So I've been around a little while. You might say I'm a spiritual old timer. How did Mr. Armstrong used to start his sermons? Let's go back to Genesis, and we'll look at how he started his sermons. I can remember this, not only his sermons at the feast, but also his sermons in general. Near the end of his life, he hit this more and more powerfully. Genesis chapter 2, we'll start reading in verses 8 and 9. And I think you know where we're headed, many of you. Verse 8. Genesis 2, the Lord God planted a garden eastward in Eden, and there he put the man whom he had formed. And out of the ground the Lord made every tree to grow that is pleasant in the sight and good for food. The tree of life was in the midst of the garden, and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Two trees God formed in the garden, in the midst of the garden, the tree of life and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Let's skip down to verse 15, and we'll read a couple more verses. Verse 15, the Lord God took man, and he put him in the garden of Eden to tend and to keep it. And the Lord commanded man, saying, Of every tree of the garden you may freely eat, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat, for in the day that you eat of it you shall surely die. God gave two trees, didn't he? He gave two choices way back there in Eden for the first man and the first woman to choose from. And they chose, didn't they? They chose for themselves and they chose on behalf of all of humanity the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. What do these trees represent? <laughs> the tree of life, we understand, represents God's way of life, ultimately undergirded by the way of give. The tree of the knowledge of good and evil represents self, doesn't it? Satan's way of life. Ultimately, the way of get. Two trees, two ways. The way of give and the way of get. The way of get started out creation. The first 6,000 years of mankind's history have been bogged down with, have been overgrown by the way of get. We see it all around us today, don't we? We see it at the feast all around us because although God has called us to come to the Feast of Tabernacles, we're not out of the world yet. We're still entrenched in it to some extent. God gave two trees. He gave two ways. The way of get has permeated the earth now, Satan's kingdom, if you will. That way of give is going to permeate 
and undergird and drive the millennium, the coming kingdom of God. Acts chapter 20, you're familiar with this? Acts chapter 20, verse 35. We'll read the scripture here together, and we'll focus on the last part of that scripture. What about this way of give? Acts chapter 20, verse 35. I have shown you in every way by laboring like this that you must support the weak. God's way. Support the weak. Give to them. And remember the words of the Lord Jesus that he said, It is more blessed to give than to receive. It is more blessed to give than receive. Christ said it's, you're not to be ministered unto, but to minister. You're not to be taking from others and having them give to you, but you are to give. He also told us about God's truth. He says, freely you've received, freely you must give it. Acts chapter 25. Excuse me, Matthew chapter 25. Go there with me. Back to the words of Jesus Christ. Matthew chapter 25 and verse 34. Matthew 25, 34. The king will say to those on his right hand, Come, you blessed of my father. This is a vision of the future, brethren. Something God has been yearning to do. Come, you blessed of my father. Inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. The Greek here is cosmos. Inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the cosmos. God wants to give this kingdom to us, doesn't he? And when will he do it? We just celebrated not long ago the Feast of Trumpets, a time that pictures the returning of Christ to the earth ultimately, the changing of God's saints, dead and alive, in Christ, in a moment, in a twinkling of an eye. They're rising in the air to meet Christ, becoming full spirit members of the family of God, marrying the bride, or marrying the groom. The bride will marry the groom. The saints, the church, will marry Jesus Christ. We'll take on a new name, and we'll do what? Let's go to Revelation chapter 21. Revelation 21. What happens when you marry someone? Ladies, what happens when you marry your husband, when you married your husband? <clears throat> In the world today, things are a little bit different. Many women actually keep their own name. In the world in the past, and still some today, Women change their name, don't they? They take on the name of their husband. What else happens when you take on the name of your husband? You take on everything that is his. It's, isn't that what happens? What is his becomes yours. What is yours becomes his. You inherit what he has. Revelation chapter 21, verse 7. You're familiar with the scripture. Revelation 21, 7, what will happen when we're changed in a moment in a twinkling of an eye? When we as the bride of Christ marry Christ, and who does the marriage? Who performs the ceremony? Obviously the Father. We become members of that spirit family, full members. He who overcomes shall inherit, inherit all things. Revelation 21, 7, and I will be his God and he shall be my son. We will be literal, spiritual children of God. We will inherit all things. Think about what we will inherit, brethren. We will inherit the name of God. We will inherit the earth and all things on the earth. We'll inherit the universe. We'll inherit God's brilliance, His intellect, His love, his drive. Brethren, we're going to inherit the kingdom of God, won't we, at that point? Let me ask you this. If you're an heir and you inherit something from someone else, maybe it's money, maybe it's property, maybe it's goods of some kind, trinkets, when you inherit those things, whose are they at that point? 
they're yours, aren't they? When we inherit something, when we inherit the kingdom of God, will it not become ours? If I inherit money from a relative, is it not mine then to give away? When we inherit the kingdom of God, is it not ours to give away on behalf of the Father along with Jesus Christ? Think about that, brethren. Think about that long and hard, 1 John chapter 3. 1 John chapter 3 and verse 2. 1 John 3, 2. You, you're familiar with the scripture. Let's read it together. Breaking in, because I did not know him, beloved, now we are children of God, and it has not yet been revealed what we shall be. We don't know exactly yet, but we know that when he is revealed, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. And everyone who has this hope in him purifies himself just as he is pure. We're going to see Christ as he is. We will see the Father as he is. We will be his own as we have been taught over and over, many of us for many, many years. Revelation chapter 20, as we... Again, set the foundation for the sermon today. Revelation 20, verse 4. You may have read this already at the feasts. I predict you'll read it again before it's over. Revelation 20, verse 4. That vision, I saw thrones, not a throne, thrones, and they sat on them, and judgment was committed to them as members of the family of God. We will inherit all things. We will inherit majesty, royalty, and the responsibilities that come with it. And I saw the souls of those who had been beheaded for their witness to Jesus and for the word of God, who had not worshipped the beast or his image and had not received a mark on their foreheads and on their hands. And they lived and they reigned. They lived and they reigned with Christ. Rulership. For a thousand years, but the rest of the dead did not live again until the thousand years were finished. This is the first resurrection, the one that happens at the beginning of the thousand years. Blessed and holy is he who has part in the first resurrection. Over such, the second death has no power. Continuing, but they shall be priests of God and of Christ and shall reign with him for a thousand years. Do you see it, brethren? We shall inherit all things. We shall be like him. We shall reign on the earth for a thousand years because Christ and the Father will give us the Father's kingdom. But, brethren, what will we do with that kingdom once we inherit it? We're not going to float around on clouds playing harps all day gazing at God in awe, yes, we will do that, but not all day long. God sees that as a waste of time. God has a plan. He loves to be worshipped, but one of the ways we worship our Creator is by carrying out His will. How will we reign, brethren, as all-powerful monarchs in the family of God? The thousand-year <clears throat> millennial period, brethren, will focus entirely on what? the earth. The physical people will reign on the earth. They are, those people, physical people, are the subjects of the kingdom of God that we will reign over and serve for a thousand years. Brethren, our job at the time will be to share God's kingdom. It will be to give God's kingdom to the people of the world. After reviewing all of my church notes last year, I was struck by something that many of you may have already put your finger on that early morning as I reviewed my sermon notes. I connected the dots, to use a phrase Mr. Weston used in a sermon a few years ago. I connected the dots in a way I hadn't quite done it before. The millennial period, brethren, pictured by this, God's Feast of Tabernacles, is not about us. 
It's entirely about them, the subjects of the kingdom of God. Human beings who live through the great tribulation and human beings who will be born into that millennial period. Brethren, how badly does the world, do the people of the world, do the children of the world need this kingdom that God has called us to help him give to them? Are you prepared? How well are you preparing, brethren, to give of yourself? To give to the people of the world for 24 hours a day, seven days a week for a thousand years and beyond. For the remainder of the sermon today, I want to share with you several elements of the kingdom of God that we will help the Father give to the world. We will help build these elements into society. We will help give people this, this truth. We will help give them these things, things that elements that the world so desperately longs for and doesn't even know they long for them. Let's talk about these for the remainder of the sermon. What is one of the things that we're going to help give to the world? What is one of the elements of God's kingdom that we'll help give? Element number one is true religion. True religion. Think about it, brethren. How many people are in the world today? And how many of them have true, godly religion? You know, out of seven, roughly seven billion people, there are about 1.2 billion Catholics in the world today. There are another roughly a billion to a billion and a half Protestants in the world today. There are over one and a half billion Muslims in the world today. There are nearly a billion Hindus in the world today. Nearly a billion Buddhists. There are estimated over 150 million atheists in the world. People who don't believe there is even a God. In fact, apparently Sweden leads the world in the number of the highest number of atheists in their population. They have almost one quarter of their population representing themselves as atheists. Something that God says even a fool, only a fool, says in his heart there is no God. These are godless people who live a pointless life. There's nothing beyond. Brethren, think about this. This is almost the entire earth. People led astray. We're going to be able to give them true religion. Micah chapter 5. If you'll turn there with me. Micah chapter 5. <clears throat> Millennial scriptures that paint an incredible picture. Micah, Nahum, Habakkuk, Zephaniah. I'm having a hard time finding Micah. There we go. Micah chapter 5. We'll start reading in verse 5 and we'll read, or excuse me, verse 10. We'll read Micah 5, 10 through 15. Let's look at the picture that God inspired the prophet Micah to paint about 2,500 years ago. Micah chapter 5, verse 10. And it shall be in that day, God is a dual prophecy here, partially fulfilled 2,500 or so years ago. It will be fulfilled in the end time. It shall be in that day, says the Lord, that I will cut off your horses from your midst and destroy your chariots. I will cut off the cities of your land and throw down your strongholds. God is going to change this evil, betrayed world, betrayed by Satan the devil, deceived by Satan the devil. I will cut off sorceries from your hand. You shall have no soothsayers. Your carved images I will cut off. Your sacred pillars from your midst. You shall no more worship the work of your hands. How many people in this world worship abominations, worship false gods, gods of silver, gods of stone? How many? Verse 14, I will pluck your wooden images from your midst. Thus, I will destroy your cities. So many of the cities of this world contain these false places of worship. We even worship gods of green, 
in the United States, the green back. We worship money. We worship military might and artillery. Look at the nations around the world who worship artillery. They have parades yearly where they display their military prowess and their military might. God says, I'm going to destroy your cities and I will execute vengeance and anger and fury on the nations that have not heard. God is going to clear the world of these false images, these things that human beings worship. Isaiah chapter 56. Turn back with me to Isaiah. 56. As you're turning to Isaiah 56, let me also encourage you, if you haven't done it in a while, you might even want to do it tonight in some personal Bible study or tomorrow morning. This won't take you long. But review 2 Chronicles chapters 29 and 30, 2 Chronicles 29 and 30, and 2 Kings 18. See what Hezekiah did, the king of Judah, righteous king of Judah. See what he did when he came to power and how he cleared the land of these false places of worship. What did God inspire Hezekiah to do with the high places? with the pagan places of worship, with the altars. You also might want to review a few chapters on King Josiah, who came to the throne at age 8. By the age of 16, began turning the nation of Judah upside down as he got rid of paganism. So chapters to study for Josiah are 2 Chronicles 34 and 35. 2 Chronicles chapters 34 and 35, and 2 Kings chapters 22 and 23. Read these chapters tonight and tomorrow. Recapture a vision of how God motivated these men to rid the land of false religion and what they were involved in doing. Okay, let's go back to Isaiah 56. We'll read verses 6 and 7 here. A millennial vision here. What is God going to do? What is God's vision of this time when His saints will help give His kingdom to the world? Verse 6, Also the sons of the foreigner who join themselves to the Lord to serve Him and to love the name of the Lord, to be His servants, everyone who keeps from defiling the Sabbath. Verse 7, Even them, brethren, these are Gentiles, foreigners, not the Israelite descended people bloodwise. This is everybody in the world. Even them I will bring to my holy mountain and make them joyful in my house of prayer. Their burnt offerings and their sacrifices will be accepted on my altar, God says. For my house shall be called a house of prayer. Not just for the Israelites but for all nations. God will gut the world, remove from the world, from the face of the world, these gods of silver, these gods of gold, these places of pagan worship, and instead replace it with His true place of worship. His true religion will be taught. The fact that there is one God, and He is in charge of all. He is the creator of all. Brethren, we are going to help give this element of the kingdom to the world. And it will change the world, will it not? How will it change when the world recognizes there is only one true God? How will the world change when there's no more false religion? Brethren, how many people in the world Pray to gods of silver. Pray to gods of stone. Pray to gods that are not gods. You know, the Hindu religion, according to some sources, the Hindu religion has over three million different gods. And I said that correctly. Three million different gods. What will it be like for those people to realize there's only one God? Again, worldly Christianity has about two and a half billion, with a B, worshipers. And they worship 
Think about this. They falsely worship God. They worship a God who condemns people to everlasting hell and torment, even if they've never had the opportunity to be taught to worship this God. That's one of the tenets of worldly Christianity, the doctrine of heaven and hell, the nasty side of that doctrine. There is a hell, fire, according to that doctrine. And if you've never had the chance to know Christ, you're going to cook and be in agony forever. What will it be like for those people to not know and be taught that pagan way anymore? What will it be like without an Islam, a religion that kills you if you leave it? What will it be like for people who used to be Hindus, who put the well-being of cattle above the well-being of people in a nation like India? You have many, many poor, poor people, yet you have well-fed and well-taken care of cows. What will the difference be? What will it be like when there are no more Buddhists who put the well-being of bugs above the well-being of people? Brethren, worldly religions elevate the self, don't they? They elevate the self. It's all about me. I've got to make it to heaven. I've got to make it to wherever I go, to nirvana, to the ultimate. It's about me getting there. God's way is about them, isn't it? It's not the way of get anymore, of worldly religions. It's the way of give. What will it be like when everyone learns to esteem others above themselves and to worship the one true God and to receive then the blessings of that one true God? God says, I will hear their prayers. We just read it. I will accept their offerings because they worship right. They worship me. Brethren, one of the elements of the kingdom that we will help give to the world is a true religion. What's another element that we'll help give to the world? Element number two that we will help give to the world is the law of God. The law of God. Now we know that, don't we? We know the law of God is going to go forth from Jerusalem and cover the earth as the waters cover the sea. But what does it mean? Brethren, when we look around the world today, we see increasingly lawless societies. Where you are sitting today at the Feast of Tabernacles, where I am, is immersed in a society that is increasingly lawless. Let me read from you, for you, <clears throat> a news and prophecy item that we published in January of 2010, January 25, 2010. And you can find this on the website if you want to review it again. It says, in a, in a syndicated column, writer Frederick Kassoon commented on the increasing political uncertainty in Guyana. Guyana is the only English-speaking nation in South America. It's on the northern coast. It's a beautiful nation with incredible potential in which we do have a couple of congregations. I've had the privilege to travel there and to serve the brethren there for years in the past. But he's writing about the uncertainty on Guyana, a country who has really corrupt government officials. In fact, of all the places I've traveled, I've never traveled to a place quite like Guyana where the local people will tell foreigners how awful their government is. You know, usually in our nations, we talk to each other about how bad our government is, but we don't want to share that with foreigners. We try and put on a good face for foreigners, put our best foot forward, so to speak. In this nation, I've had all kinds of people on the streets and taxi cabs tell me how bad their government is. So this individual is writing, and he says, quote, Last year was punctuated with fear, silence, inexplicabilities, as the exercise of power became more demonic, more abominable, the society became even more reticent. Continuing in the quote, 
In 2009, the miasma flowed from every conceivable corner of the corridors of power, but only the U.S. Embassy gave us hope. It acted against a child molester who occupies a position of importance in the corridors of power, unquote. And that was taken from the Kaitir News, a Guyanese paper, on from the January 8 issue, 2010. There was a government official who was molesting children, and the government was looking the other way. And it took the U.S. Embassy getting involved to make some changes, to bring about change, to call this fellow to justice. Let me continue from the article itself. It says, in Guyana, as in many nations around the globe, political corruption runs deep, as those who gain power go to great lengths to maintain it. Even amid a declining moral foundation, the U.S. still maintains a value base that promotes proper treatment of children. America is still willing to push for proper treatment in nations in which it has little to no jurisdiction. God warned that in the last days, leaders would gain power and be only interested in feeding themselves. And that's from Ezekiel 34, verses 2 through 5. However, even in its current state of moral deterioration, the U.S. and Israelite-descended nations are still a blessing to other nations. Genesis 18, 18. When I read that article, it brought tears to my eyes. Because... Here is a nation with so much potential, Guyana. Beautiful people. Incredible resources. And it's a floundering nation at this point. I can't wait to, God willing, work with the nation and the people in the millennium and help give them God's kingdom. Work with some of my Guyanese brothers and sisters right together. Helping give them the kingdom of God. Helping give these people God's law. God's law that says respect each other, love your neighbor, treat children properly. Something that's not being done today. How will God's law change the world, brethren? Let me um, read another piece. Uh, this is taken from, the information is taken from the Association France Presse, AFP, October 29, 2014. It's a little bit of information about uh, the Turkish President Erdogan. It says he opened his new palace outside Ankara. He had a perfectly sufficient historical palace within the city limits. The new palace has, get this brethren, 1,000 rooms and over 21 million square feet of space. 21 million square feet. That's... <laughs> ridiculously large. It cost over $350 million to build. He opened the new home with tremendous cost overruns and extravagance as Tur Turkey is struggling to maintain its nationhood. <laughs> a ruler governing a people, a ruler governing without the law of God, a ruler governing based on self, based on the way of get and not based on the way of give. Let's go to Micah chapter 4. <clears throat> Back to the book of Micah. And we'll see what God has to say, a little bit more of his vision of the kingdom of God, of this coming kingdom that we have been asked to help give, as we think about the law of God that will help give to the world. Micah 4 verses 1 and 2 it shall come to pass in the latter days that the mountain of the Lord's house shall be established on top of the mountains. God's kingdom will be above all kingdoms and shall be exalted above the hills and people shall flow to it. We see a similar scripture in Isaiah. This is verse 2. Many nations shall come and say, Come, let us go up to the mountain of the Lord's house, to the house of the God of Jacob. He will teach us his ways and we shall walk in his paths. What is the path? of God's kingdom, the way we walk, we walk down the steps of the Ten Commandments. He shall judge between, or the word of the Lord shall come from Jerusalem. He shall judge between nations and peoples, rebuke strong nations afar off. They shall beat their swords into plowshares. Brethren, what commandment is this? Thou shalt not kill. When you get rid of war, 
you begin to cease the killing process. They'll beat their spears into pruning hooks. Nation shall not lift up sword against nation, neither shall they learn war any more. No more war, no more killing in that vehicle. What causes war? Lust, greed, covetousness. No more Tenth Commandment broken. No more Sixth Commandment broken. 1 John chapter 5. As we think about giving the law of God to the world, and we could talk for sermon after sermon on this topic, but I want you to think how different the world will be when we are able to give the law of God, this element of God's kingdom to the world. 1 John chapter 5 and verse 3. 1 John 5 and verse 3. For this is the love of God, that we keep His commandments and His commandments are not burdensome. We will be spiritual members of the family of God at this time, members of the God family. We will keep the law but it will be inherent in who we are. We'll help the world keep the law, and it will change the world. What will happen when the whole world learns to obey the law of God? Go to Leviticus with me, chapter 26. This is an age-old promise that God made. God never breaks a promise. The principle is still strong. The promise still exists. It doesn't stop. What do we see? Leviticus chapter 26, one of the blessing and cursing chapters. We'll look at the beginning of the chapter here, verse 3. What's the promise? And this is what will happen in the kingdom of God. Because God's law is a living law. And when it is kept, there are living blessings built into the process. When the world is given the law of God and they choose to keep it, this is what they will experience. This is what we will help give to them. Leviticus 26, verse 3, If you walk in my statutes and you keep my commandments and perform them, then I will give you rain in its season, and the land shall yield its produce. The trees of the field shall yield their fruit. Verse 5, Your threshing shall last till the time of vintage. The vintage shall last till the time of sowing, and you shall eat your bread to the full and dwell in your land in safety. And I don't have time to go on reading about the peace that shall come, the blessings of protection that shall come. But we see that when people obey God, they keep His laws, they receive rain. They are blessed with abundance, so much abundance that when it's time to plant they're still reaping the harvest from weeks or months before. And when it's time to reap the harvest, they're still reaping when it's time to plant again. What an amazing thing. Amos chapter 9. Amos chapter 9 and verse 15. Amos 9 verse 15. God says, I will plant them in their land. No longer shall they be pulled up. From the land I have given them, says the Lord your God. Amos 9, let's go back to verse 13. He says, Behold, the days are coming, says the Lord, when the plowman shall overtake the reaper. Come on, guys, get in all of these crops from the field. What's taking you so long? I've got to plant. And the reapers are saying, there's too much. It's taking us longer than we thought because there's so much abundance. The mountains will drip with sweet wine. All the hills shall flow with it. Again, the abundance. I'll bring back the captives of my people, Israel. They shall build the waste cities and inhabit them. They shall plant vineyards and drink from them. They shall also make gardens and eat fruit from them. I'll give them their land. I'll plant them in their land. And we read earlier that it's not just the Israelite descendants that will be blessed. It's the Gentiles. It's everyone in the world because of obedience to these laws. Isaiah chapter 30. This is an interesting sort of aside It's related. What is one of the reasons that there's going to be so much abundance in food in the kingdom of God? Yes, one reason is because there will be rain in due season. 
there will be plenty of water. Isaiah chapter 30, verse 24. There's also another piece here. Isaiah 30, verse 24. Then he will give, or excuse me, verse 24. Likewise, the oxen and the young donkeys that work the ground will eat cured fodder, not just the green grass. There's going to be so much left over that the, the grass is going to be made into hay. It will be stacked and it will be cured. It will have sat for a while. And what happens when you have hay sit for a while? It begins to break down. You get a little bit of alcohol esters that are produced. Sugars come out of the grain. It's this nice, sweet, I don't know that I would go eat it, but from the perspective of a horse or a, a cow, I guess, nice, sweet, savory substance they get to eat because of the abundance of the previous years. They will eat cured fodder, which has been winnowed with the shovel and the fan. Verse 25, there will be on every high mountain and on every high hill rivers and streams of water, abundance. You know, you look at the Middle East today, and what do you see on high mountains and high hills? Rock and dirt. No water. This will change. In the day of great slaughter, when the towers fall, when the towers, the, the high places, the wicked high places are taken low. Moreover, verse 26, the light of the moon will be as bright as that of the sun, and the light of the sun will be sevenfold. As the light of seven days, in the day that the Lord builds up the bruise of his people and heals the stroke of their wound. You know, there's something that older farmers understand about planting. Sometimes people cast some of this off as um, demonism or witchcraft or being hokey. But farmers know that there's a certain time of the month that is best to plant seed. And that if that seed breaks through the surface around the time of the full moon, the seed will grow stronger. It will grow better. It will produce more fruit. Why is that? Because that moon is reflecting the light of the sun. And sometimes when there's a full moon, it's almost like daylight. What does that do for the seed? The seedling now, with the, the green leaves that come up out of the dirt? Plants need sunlight to produce oxygen, to break down sugars, to grow. And if you plant just right, you can get some of that sunlight reflected off the moon and actually have a longer growing period. If when this happens, the moonlight is as bright as the sun, think about how that will impact green things. Things will grow more rapidly and more lushly when that happens. All because people obey God. All because they keep the law of God. Brethren, what will it be like when people keep the law? What will it be like when there is no more adultery and individuals don't bring the baggage, the emotional scars and some of the physical scars of sexual relations outside marriage into a marriage? No more people bringing in those terrible memories into their marriage to share with their husband or wife. What will it be like when there's no more adultery in a marriage? What begins to happen? Marriages last, don't they? What happens when people don't lust after someone else? Marriages last. What happens when people bring into their marriage, give, give, give? Marriages last. Brethren, what will it be like when there's no more divorce? How many of you have been affected by divorce. Either directly, you've gone through a divorce, your parents have gone through a divorce, your children have gone through a divorce, or a very close friend. Go ahead, raise your hand. How many of us, look around, how many of us have been affected by divorce? God says divorce is violent in Malachi chapter 2. He hates it. What will it be like when you have generations of children who are born in the millennium who've never experienced divorce. Brethren, this is the law. 
that we will help give to this world. Think about it. Meditate more on some of the commandments. The commandments that we will help give to the world to help change the world. What's a third element of God's kingdom that we will help give to the world? The third element is everlasting peace everywhere. Everlasting peace everywhere. What will that be like? Let's go back to Leviticus chapter 26. No everlasting peace won't hit the world in one fell swoop. It will take a while to permeate, to go out from Jerusalem. But the option will be there for all. Again, back to Leviticus 26. We were there a minute ago. Verse 6. Leviticus 26, verse 6. I will give peace in the land, and you shall lie down, and none will make you afraid. None will make you afraid. Turn to Isaiah 57 with me as we ponder this point. You'll lie down in your beds, and none will make you afraid. Have you ever been afraid when you lie down in your bed? Young people, children? Have you ever been afraid when you lie down in your bed? Yes, Satan shoots fiery darts of doubt and fear. Remember, during the millennium, there will be no more Satan, the devil. He'll be gone. He'll be bound along with his minions, and they won't be able to shoot fiery darts anymore. Isaiah chapter 57, verses 1 and 2. <clears throat> Notice this. this. We also read, often read this parable or this passage of Scripture at funerals. But think about it in terms of what we're talking about in the millennium. The righteous perishes and no one takes it to heart. Merciful men are taken away. No one considers that the righteous is taken away from evil. Brethren, in the kingdom... You and I will help take the righteous away from evil. Giving them God's law and God's, law, God's way of life will help take them from evil. He shall enter into peace. They shall rest in their beds, each one walking in his uprightness. Brethren, how many people around the world today go to bed scared? How many people go to bed scared? How many people go to bed and don't even have a soft mattress to sleep on? Brethren, you have brethren around the world, in other parts of the world, that don't sleep on a mattress at night. They may be blessed to sleep on a hammock, but it's a different feeling. People will sleep in their beds. <laughs> They'll probably have something like a very soft mattress to sleep in. But they will sleep comfortable. They'll sleep warm if it's a colder climate or cooler if it's a hot climate. They'll sleep on a soft bed. Brethren, we will give God's perfect society, peace-filled society to the world. Zephaniah chapter 3. Zephaniah chapter 3. Near the end of our Old Testament. Zephaniah chapter 3, verse 12. What does God say here? I will leave in your midst a meek and humble people. They shall trust in the name of the Lord. Zephaniah 3, verse 12. I'm missing the passage that I was looking for, where no one will make them afraid. Let's go to Jeremiah chapter 4, though. Another millennial scripture, Jeremiah chapter 4, 23, verse 4. Jeremiah 23 and verse 4. Jeremiah 23, 4. I will set up shepherds over them who will feed them. Not a shepherd. Shepherds, us, brethren. I'll set up shepherds over them who will feed them. They shall fear no more nor be dismayed nor shall they be lacking, says the Lord. No more fear, brethren. How many people live under the fear of losing their home? They go to sleep thinking about that every night. How many people live under the fear of terrorist acts? 
of bombs going off around them, of wondering if marauders are going to come in and steal from them, rape them, destroy their homes, run them out of town. How many fear? Brethren, we are going to give to this world everlasting peace. Isaiah 11. We read this at the feast. We sing about this at the feast. But notice this, brethren. It's not just people, human beings, who will be given peace. Not just human beings who will be given peace. The world itself. The animals, the creatures will be given peace. Isaiah 11 and verse 6. The wolf shall dwell with the lamb. You probably have sung about this already at the feast. The leopard shall lie down with the young goat, the calf, and the young lion, and the fat laying together, and a little child will lead them. Verse 7. A cow shall graze. A cow and a bear shall graze. Their young ones shall lie down together. The lion shall eat straw like an ox. The nursing child shall play by the cobra's hole, and the weaned child shall put his hand on the viper's den. Verse 9. Look at the peace. They shall not hurt or destroy in all my holy mountain, for the earth shall be full of the knowledge of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. Brethren, how many animals live in fear? Think about it. Have you ever seen a program, a nature program? Have you ever looked out your door or your window, been in God's creation and seen animals eating? If you watch deer or antelope, or something like that eat. They eat with their eyes looking all around. There's oftentimes a sentinel sort of standing in the background watching. And it's not just deer, it's all kinds of animals. What are they watching for? They're watching for the predators who will take advantage of them when they're not looking. Even the Earth's creatures live in fear, brethren. Worried that they're going to be eaten and killed. All the earth, brethren, will be filled with everlasting peace, and you and I are called to give this peace to the world. What's a fourth element of the kingdom that we will give to the world? Go with me to Genesis 11, if you would. A fourth element of the kingdom, and there are many more, but a fourth element that we are called to help the Father give. Genesis 11 to the kingdom. Brethren, we're going to help give a pure language to the world. A pure language. <laughs> what does that mean? Let's go back. As we look at Genesis 11, we'll read, starting in verse 1, we'll read about a time when there was one language, no doubt pure when God gave it to Adam and Eve, but defective by the time we read of Babel, almost 2,000 years later. <clears throat> now the whole earth had one language, Genesis 11, 1, and one speech. And it came to pass that they journeyed from the east, and they'd found a plain in the land of Shinar, and they dwelt there. And they said to one another, Come, let us make bricks and bake them thoroughly. They had brick for stone, and they had asphalt for mortar. And they said, Come, let us build ourselves a city and a tower whose top is in the heavens. Let us make a name for ourselves, lest we be scattered abroad over the face of the whole earth. This motivation came. And because everybody understood everyone, they were all in solidarity on some level, apparently. Verse 5. But the Lord came down to see the city and the tower, which the sons of men had built. And the Lord said, Indeed, the people are one, and they have one language. And this is what they begin to do. Now nothing that they propose to do will be withheld from them. Come, let us go down and confuse their language, that they may not understand one another's speech. So the Lord scattered them abroad from there over the face of the earth, and they ceased building the city. Therefore its name is Babel, because there the Lord confused the languages of all the earth. From there the Lord scattered them abroad over the face of the earth. God divided the people using language because of the trouble they were getting in. God is going to restore a pure language, Zephaniah chapter 3. Let's go back to Zephaniah. Been there a couple of times already today. 
Zephaniah chapter 3. And let's read a little bit more about this pure language that God is going to restore. Zephaniah 3, verses 9 through 13, then I will restore. It means to give back to the people a pure language or a pure lip that they may call on the name of the Lord to serve Him with one accord. <laughs> Language can unify, can't it? Some of us are at feast sites where there is translation because there's more than one language. And although we have God's same Holy Spirit and can communicate on some level, that language is divisive, isn't it? It prevents us. The language barrier is divisive. It prevents us from really digging down deep and being one in a more powerful way spiritually. So he's going to restore a pure language that they may call on the name of the Lord to serve him together with one accord. From beyond the rivers of Ethiopia, my worshipers, the daughter of my dispersed ones, shall bring my offering. In that day you shall not be ashamed for any of your deeds in which you transgress against me, for then I will take away them from your midst. Those who rejoice in your pride, and you shall not or no longer be haughty in my holy mountain. I will leave in your midst a meek and a humble people, and they shall trust in the name of the Lord. The remnant of Israel shall no more do unrighteousness and speak no lies, nor shall a deceitful tongue be found in their mouth. For they shall feed their flocks and lie down. And as we read a few minutes ago, no one will make them afraid. No one will make them afraid. Brethren, what will it be like with a pure language? A pure language. Think about it. Not just a good language. Not just a perfectly functional language, which God's language will be. But a pure language. A language without spot, without blemish. Like a clean, clear glass of water. Something that you can enjoy. A language that sounds beautiful to the ear and that rolls off the tongue like water. A language that is free from nuanced ideas that are wrong. A language that is free from sinful vocabulary. So much of the way we think today is impacted by language. When you think, you, you think in words, do you not? When I think, I know I think in words. If we remove foul words, vulgar words, double entendres, how different will our thought processes be over time? Think about this. Brethren, we are called to help give the world a pure language. How will that change society? Think about it. Brethren, in John 3.16, we are reminded that God, the Father, so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, Jesus Christ, so that those who would believe in Him would not perish, but would have everlasting life. Christ, as the Lamb of God, was planned to come from the foundation of the cosmos, the foundation of the world. God has had this plan for a long time, to give His kingdom to the world. Brethren, He's called you, and He's called me. And yes, young people, you are included. He's called us all to be His first fruits, to help Him give His kingdom to the world. Brethren, we, you and I, need to be developing that same type of love for the people of the world that God has. No, not a love for society, but a love for God's children made in His image. It's the love for the world, for the people of the world, brethren, that will motivate us to be patient enough to help give them God's kingdom. As I said earlier in the sermon, brethren, the time pictured by the Feast of Tabernacles, the millennium, is not about us. The millennium is all about them. Matthew chapter 28, the end of the chapter, verses 19 and 20. Give us the commission. Christ left, and right before He left this earth, He gave His church, He gave His disciples the commission to go to the world and preach the gospel to all creatures, baptizing them into My name, 
and giving them this truth. Brethren, giving the gospel to the world now is a chance for us to show God our character and how badly we desire to help Him give His kingdom to the world. Giving the gospel to the world now is preparing for giving the kingdom of God to the world in the millennium. If our hearts are not fully behind the preaching of the gospel, the truth about the kingdom, what are we telling God about our desire to help Him give His kingdom to the world one day? Are you preparing your life now? Are you preparing your heart now and your mind now to help God give His kingdom to this desperate world? Brethren, how badly do you yearn to do this? As we open with God's way of life, brethren, is a way of give. God's kingdom will be a time to give. God's kingdom will be a time where the saints help Christ give the Father's kingdom to the people of the world. And that giving of the kingdom will continue into the white throne judgment. Brethren, if we're going to be there to help Christ with this tremendous privilege and opportunity, with this big task, we must be developing that heartfelt give focus now. I encourage you, as you leave this afternoon, as you go out to lunch, as you spend time with your brethren, with your family, as you go out to dinner this evening, talk about giving the kingdom to the world. Talk about, brethren, why you want to help Christ give His kingdom to the world. We have an incredible opportunity ahead of us. We will inherit the kingdom of God, something that God has planned for a long time, something He desires to do. But brethren, we as first fruits are a pittance of humanity. God has called us to be changed in a moment of twinkling of an eye. He's called us to become members of His family as His first fruits. Why? For the reason that the Feast of Tabernacles is here. We have been called to give God's kingdom to the world.